Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis for today. Before we begin, there are a couple of very very important announcements that you need to listen to. First, the big news initiative is back on our YouTube channel. As you know, under this initiative, we bring to you the biggest news of that day that is being covered throughout the entire country. This will be a live video every day at 2 p.m. right here on our YouTube channel by the name of the big news. So don't forget to join that as well. Also, this week's international relations that is tomorrow on Wednesday that will go at 8 p.m. on our YouTube channel will be the episode number 90 of this series. Please don't forget to join that as well. As you know, under this initiative, we try and cover the most important news regarding international relations for the entire week. Well, let's begin with the first article that is written by Mr. M. K. Narayanan, who is a former director of Intelligence Bureau, a former chairman of the Joint Committee on Intelligence, and also a former national security advisor. He has written this article mainly to tell how the countries around the world, including India, are now facing a new kind of a threat. That is the threat of cyber attacks. Now, this is not the first article that has been written on this topic. As you know, every few weeks we have this kind of a topic written in the editorial where the authors are trying to tell the governments that they need to be ready for the upcoming challenges. The author here is saying that cyber threat is becoming by far the biggest threat that any country is facing right now. Gone are the days when we just used to focus on weapons, on nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, orthodox weapons, etc. Now is the time that the nations around the world, many of them are making cyber experts a part of their military as well. Spread of misinformation against the other country has also become an integral part of these kind of attacks. We are seeing this in Russia-Ukraine conflict as well. A lot of tactics being used by Ukraine are about information warfare. While they are spreading information with regards to Russia and Russia is also doing the same. These can also be termed as something called the grey zone operations. Now grey zone operations are in very simple terms operations which are not very peaceful but also which are not a declaration of war. They are somewhere in between. They are not the traditional attacks that one nation does on the other. They are just alternative kind of things in which one nation tries to irritate the other nation and tries to bring them down. This is where cyber warfare has become so, so relevant. As you have seen, India also in the past few years have seen such kind of attacks. During the pandemic, there was a blackout that we saw in the entire city of Mumbai. It was later found out that it was because of certain Chinese hackers trying to hack into the system. Not just this, recently, as per the author, there was a report that some Russians have been arrested in India for trying to hack into the computers which were involved in the conduct of the IIT entrance examinations in India. Imagine how big a thing that is. The IIT entrance examination being hacked by someone by hacking into those computers where the papers are stored. Institutions which are known not just in India but worldwide for their technology, those institutions coming under these kind of attacks is extremely, extremely ironic. This also would be a dent to the image of a country such as India. That is why these kind of attacks should be taken extremely, extremely seriously and the cyber warfare is now an integral part of any nation's peace and war policy. Now, as I said, the article mentions something about the grey zone operations. Let's see what these are. Now, grey zone operations, as I said, are those activities that are somewhere between peace and war. There are a lot of activities that come, come into this particular category that can be assassinations of important people, spreading of disinformation, also sending mercenaries to attack the other nation without officially launching an attack, cyber attacks, these kind of operations all come under the category of the grey zone operations. These are usually taken up by non-state actors which are not directly connected to the government but are supported at the back end by the government of the country. Also, their aim is to destabilize and attack the adversary to show the vulnerabilities of that country so that they can be exploited further. No country right now is actually over it. US, China, Russia, European nations, India, Australia, all of these either face such attacks or try to conduct such attacks on other nations. So this is a time 
where you cannot be an ideal nation thinking that the other countries should not undertake these attacks. This is now a reality of our times and we just need to be ready with it. That is why the government has also started certain initiatives in the field of cyber security. These are the ones that I wanted to share with you. We have something called the Cyber Surakshit Bharat Initiative launched in 2018 to spread awareness about cyber crimes in the entire country. Under this, the government departments would have their chief information security officers and frontline IT staff to prevent such attacks from happening in those government departments. We also have the Cyber Swachhata Kendra. It's a part of the initiative under Digital India, under Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. They try to create a secure cyberspace by ensuring that there are no botnet infections that happen in India. We also have the online cyber crime reporting portal as the name suggests. This is a portal where you can actually launch complaints related to cyber crimes, especially the ones that are focused against women, children, etc. We also have the Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center. It is I4C. This was launched in October 2018 to deal with cyber crimes in a coordinated manner across the country. So yes, the government has taken certain initiatives, but a lot more needs to be done in the future as well. The next article that we have here is about analyzing whether or not India's economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic was at par with the other nations or not. The article mainly is based on a recent World Bank report titled Correcting Course. This is a report which has highlighted how people across the world during the pandemic were pushed into extreme poverty and India was not an exception. The report highlights that the number of people living in extreme poverty has increased for the first time in the last two decades. The number has increased from 8.4% to 9.3% mainly because of the pandemic. Now, as you know, because of the pandemic, globally, we saw the nations shutting down their economic activities. Now, while the richer nations had an option to give money to their poor people, to give money to sustain their economies, as we saw in Europe, in US, etc., the poorer nations could not really do that. That is why the poorer nations did not really have their fiscal policy in place to help their economy. India was somewhere in between. While there were no benefits given to everyone, yes, there were some targeted benefits given mainly about food grain distribution that is continuing even today. The author says that we are still in a recovery mode and even though the pandemic is gone, we are still trying to figure out how to bring our economy back on track. The author says that at this point, there are three priorities that the governments must take into consideration. Number one, they should have targeted subsidies to benefit the poor. So no subsidies which are given to everyone, but subsidies given to those people who specifically need it. Ensure public investment for building resilience in the long term. Public investment can include building of hospitals, healthcare facilities, education, etc. And third, revenue mobilization that should rely on progressive direct taxation and not indirect tax. As you know, indirect taxes are the ones that impact the poor mostly negatively. Direct taxes are the ones that are based on your income. So the more you earn, the more you pay. The indirect taxes are the ones, for example, that are put on biscuit, on petrol, etc. So if you are buying a biscuit, a very rich person is buying that biscuit or a poor person is buying that biscuit. Everyone is paying the same tax. That should not be the way that the taxes are collected. The same report talks about India as well. The report says that Indian economy still continues to reel under the impact that it had of the COVID. As per the World Bank, over five and a half crore people are likely to have slipped into poverty in India specifically because of the pandemic. Yes, you would have seen the recent numbers according to which India will be the fastest growing major economy in the world in the coming years. But you have to understand this is mainly because of the low base that India has now had because of the slowdown in the economic activities. All these numbers of the growth are all based on the base that you have. Lower base because of decreasing GDP in the past few years has held India in inflating that number. The author says that the Indian government should have done much more as compared to what it has. For example, the Indian government, unlike most of the other main nations across the world, the developed nations, 
the Indian government did not really give any cash transfer to the middle class people as well. Also, even when you see the Manarega wages, as you know, in the COVID-19 lockdown, lakhs and crores of people lost their jobs in the cities, went back to the villages and took up Manarega work. For that, government of India increased the Manarega wages by only rupees 20 per day. Although this increase was necessary, but it was still very, very small. The government of India also did not really announce any package. The package that the government of India gave was not really money transfer from the government. It was credit lines, means kind of loans that had to be paid back. So unlike the other countries around the world, the Indian government did not really transfer any money. It was more of loans that were given and the government said that we are helping you, which was not really the ideal way forward. The only good part, as we discussed earlier also, was a free food distribution under Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan An Yojana, which is continuing even today. But the reality is, even though we have this scheme continuing for such a long time, the recently released Global Hunger Index shows India at 107th position amongst 121 nations. So even that is not working properly. Yes, we are filling the stomachs of the people in India, but we are not able to provide them with the adequate nutrition that is required. Now, the article also says that one other point of problem where the government of India did not do well was about the tax policies. Throughout the pandemic, India continued to have low corporate tax. That is why the government of India could have earned more money from the corporates, but it did not do that. As you know, in September 2019, the corporate tax was reduced from 30% to 22%. As per the government's own numbers, this reduction in the corporate tax cost the government 1.84 lakh crore rupees. So throughout the pandemic, as per multiple reports, when the corporate profits actually increased, at the same time, they were still not asked to pay more taxes. So while at one hand we had the middle class, we had the lower middle class, being pushed into poverty. On the other hand, the corporates are still not being asked by the government to pay more money. This is what the author is saying, where the government of India lost the plot. Now, the same article on the World Bank report actually shows us very, very interesting graphs. This is a graph that actually shows about how the COVID-19 pandemic shocked the entire world. As you can see here, the poverty rate has been declining continuously since 1950s. All of a sudden in 2020, if you actually see, the poverty rate for the first time jumped as compared to the earlier years. Similarly, annually, if you can see the change, that is the number of people who are coming out of poverty or going into poverty. For the first time, these people actually increased in two decades. This is also something that the world must learn from and ensure that if in the future we have this kind of a shock again, our economy should be better prepared. Similarly, the report also talks about the global inequality trends. As you know, whenever poverty increases, whenever more people are pushed into poverty, we will always have a situation where the global inequality will also increase. This is exactly what happened in 2020. The inequality between the poorest and the rich people increased drastically because while the rich became richer, the poor became poorer. This is true in terms of actual numbers also and in terms of percentage also. Both of these have been highlighted by the World Bank report. The next article that we have here is on a very interesting topic on what happened in the Supreme Court. Now, let me try and explain in very simple terms what this article is about. The authors say that recently, a constitution bench of the Supreme Court said that a judgment delivered by a larger bench will prevail over decision of a smaller bench irrespective of the number of judges that are in favor of the decision. Let me try and explain this to you with a very simple example. There is a five judge bench. Now let's assume in this five judge bench, while deciding on a matter, all five judges decided on a matter in a certain way. They said that yes, a person is guilty. Okay. Now let's assume that this person appealed in the court once again, saying that no, we want to take up the matter again. And this matter now was taken up by a larger bench of seven judges. Now in this seven judges, the outcome is four judges said yes, 
three judges said no. Now the question is simple. Will this decision overturn the earlier decision or not? Because earlier decision was by a five judge bench. This is by a seven judge bench. But in the earlier decision, five judges had said yes. In this bench, only four are saying yes. So now what will happen? This is what the issue is in the Supreme Court. Now this issue has been resolved. Supreme Court has said that from now onwards, without any confusion, any judgment given by a larger bench, seven judges, nine judges, 13 judges, whichever judgment is given by a larger bench, that will be final. Doesn't matter how many judges inside the bench had said yes or no. That doesn't matter. We will only talk about the complete strength of the bench and we will not talk about how many judges were in favor of the decision. This is what the Supreme Court has said finally and settled the matter. As you know, in the Supreme Court, a lot of cases are heard by just two judges bench, which is called a division bench. And many other cases are heard by a three judge bench called a full bench. For example, the recent hijab issue also, which was an issue from Karnataka, was also heard by a two judge bench, as you would have seen. In the two judge bench, if both the judges don't agree to each other, then obviously this matter will go to a higher bench. But usually if the bench has odd number of judges, then the majority of the judges, whatever they say, becomes a final decision of the bench. Now, a majority decision is taken as a decision of the entire bench. For example, in a seven judge bench, even if four said yes, three said no, even then this decision will be considered as a seven judge decision. For example, all of you, I'm sure, have read about the Keshwananda Bharati case. We all say Keshwananda Bharati case was decided by a 13 judge bench. But out of those 13, only seven were in favor of the basic structure doctrine. Six were against it. But even then, because a majority was in favor, we still say it was a 13 judge bench. Similarly, the Supreme Court has said that the total strength of the bench should be more than the last time. Doesn't matter how many judges inside the bench are saying yes or no. Now, if you look at other nations around the world that have a similar kind of a structure, in US and South Africa, that doesn't happen. Why? Because in US and South Africa, whenever any decision has to be challenged, then the entire court sits. US, for example, has nine Supreme Court judges. So all nine will sit together. On the other hand, Supreme Courts in UK and Australia follow same kind of a process as is followed in India and now has been cleared by the Supreme Court as well. The authors here have given a recommendation. They say that one thing that can be done in the future is that whenever a larger bench has to be made in the court to revisit the matter again, the larger bench should be made in such a way that their majority number should be equal or greater than the entire smaller bench. For example, if there is a decision of five judge bench that has to be heard again, then it should not be heard by seven judges. It should be heard by at least nine judges. So that even if half of the nine judges agree, at least five will have to agree so that we can overturn that judgment. This is a suggestion given by the authors. Let's see if the Supreme Court does anything about that. Now, as the article mentions, it was a constitution bench of the court that has decided that from now onwards, this will be followed. The constitution bench, as you know, is a bench of the Supreme Court having five or more judges. Now, this is not very, very common. Please do understand most of the cases in the Supreme Court are heard either by a two or maximum three judge bench. It's a rare occurrence to have a five or more judges bench. The concept of constitution bench, in fact, has been mentioned in the Constitution of India as well. Article 145 says that minimum number of judges who are to sit for the purpose of deciding any case involving substantial matter of law as to interpretation of the constitution will be five. Also, under Article 143, as you know, the President of India can seek the legal opinion of the Supreme Court. Those opinions are also given by at least a five-judge bench and not less than that. Also, whenever there is a conflicted judgment by a smaller bench, it is usually referred to a larger bench, which is the constitutional bench. That is why the constitutional bench is significant. This was also in the news because just a few days back, the Chief Justice of India, just say UU Lalit, had announced that throughout the entire year, at least one constitution bench will be working. This was important because, as you know, Supreme Court also takes multiple vacations during which constitution benches don't work. 
That is why many important cases are not heard during the vacation. So now Chief Justice has said that constitution bench will be working throughout the entire year. The next article that we have here is on an issue which has been a problematic thing for the Indian government for the past few months now. That is India's declining foreign reserve exchange. As you know, the Indian rupee has touched an all-time low as compared to dollar. The rupee has just reached the 82 per dollar mark. While this is a concern for some and some people are ignoring it. The other thing which is a concern for everyone is that India's foreign currency assets such as gold, SDR, dollar, etc. They are declining at a very, very fast speed. Foreign exchange, as you know, is extremely important for those nations mainly who have to import a lot of stuff. Now, there are multiple ways to look at it. First, India is not the only country with which this is happening. If you look at strong currencies around the world, pound, euro, etc., all of them are weakening against the dollar. So it's a problem that is being faced by many nations around the world. The reason is very, very simple. The US Federal Reserve is increasing their interest rate. So dollar from across the world is exiting the market and going back to the US market, thus strengthening the dollar and weakening the other currencies. As a finance minister also had said recently about the strengthening of the dollar, the same is happening here yet again. So as you can see, these currencies and their weakening trend is not just a trend that has been seen in India. As you can see this table, look at the Swedish krona, look at Polish currency, look at UK pound. All these are at an all time low level. Look at Philippine peso, Indian rupee. All these have lost considerable value. Look at Japan. Japanese yen has lost over 25 percent of their value just in the past few months. This is all because of dollars withdrawal from all these markets. As you know, central banks from around the world try to defend the value of their currency by spending the foreign reserves, by trying to control inflation. And this is why the foreign reserves are also declining in the nations around the world and not just India. It is because of the global inflation and the trend is a global trend in not just India. You can see this table. China, in fact, tops the nations that have been spending their foreign exchange reserves. Then we have Japan, Switzerland, etc. India has also spent close to $100 billion just in the last nine months from its foreign exchange reserve. Our main aim is to stabilize the value of a currency against the dollar, but that does not seem to be happening. India does have the fifth largest foreign exchange reserves in the entire world. But as you know, this is a concern because India also has to spend a lot of foreign exchange reserves for importing extremely important commodities such as a crude oil. So, yes, this is a concern for India, number one. But the other way to look at it is that India is not the only country in the world. As I said, you can see here the total foreign reserves that the nations hold and then see the percentage change in the past few months. That is the amount of foreign exchange reserves that they have spent. Look at Singapore, 30% of foreign exchange reserves is what they have spent in the past few months. Switzerland, China, Japan, India, Russia. Similarly, the value of the local currencies around the world is actually depreciating. The one very interesting currency here is Russian ruble that has in fact strengthened as compared to it being on the weaker side. That is because, as you know, Russia now is not really exchanging its currency against the dollar. So it's not really dependent on the dollar. Dollar anyway does not have a lot of presence in the Russian market now because of which it is not following the declining trend. One more thing. This is not the first time that the Reserve Bank has been on a spending spree for a foreign exchange reserve. Whenever you see an economic crisis emerging, the World Bank will take up such a trend. The same was in 2008, 2013. The change was, back then, our foreign exchange reserves were much, much lower, close to $300 billion. Now, it was, when it started to happen, over $600 billion, although the spending speed is much, much higher. But the good part is that we do have more foreign exchange reserves as compared to earlier. So we just hope that the rupee value stabilizes and the Reserve Bank of India does not have to continue this trend. The next article that we have here is on a topic that comes in the news every couple of months. That is 
in the imposition and the discontent that this debate actually arises, especially from the South Indian states. The reason why this is in the news is, as you know, as for the media reports, I am saying the media reports because nothing is official from the side of the government. As for the media reports, the recommendation of the parliamentary committee on official language is to use Hindi as a medium of instruction in central institutions of higher education in Hindi speaking states and regional languages in other states and try to take out English as much as possible. This as expected has led to a lot of very very drastic comments coming in from Tamil Nadu, Kerala and other such states. As you know the history, in the Constituent Assembly, Hindi was voted as the official language by only one single vote. But to ensure that non-Hindi speaking states also are happy, English was also given the same status for 15 years. But even before that ended, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru had promised in 1959 that don't worry, the use of English will continue as long as the non-Hindi speakers want it. However, even then, when the 15-year period ended, there were agitation that was seen in the state of Tamil Nadu specifically. Now, the connection between Tamil Nadu and this anti-Hindi agitation is very, very old. In fact, pre-independence, August 1937, was the first time that in the presidency of Madras, C. Rajagopalachari had decided to make Hindi compulsory in secondary schools. That led to the first anti-Hindi agitation in Madras at that time led by none other than Periyar, that is E.V. Ramasamy. This agitation has continued in different forms even today. After independence, as I said, even though there was a kind of a guarantee given by the Prime Minister, the people of Tamil Nadu were unhappy about the imposition of Hindi. The reason why this agitation has become even more common these days is that although different leaders have given assurances that Hindi will not be imposed, in the past few months, there have been some signals which has angered the people. For example, the national education policy focuses on Hindi. Then, even on the national highways in the state of Tamil Nadu, there are many reports that say that English signs are being replaced by Hindi signs. So, there is a kind of a discontent that is brewing in the non-Hindi speaking states. And that is why such agitations have become more and more common. Now, this proposal that has come in by the official parliamentary committee, as I said again, and I'll repeat it, it is not official from the government of India's side. It is thus media reports. So media reports are saying that as per the recommendations given by this panel, they are saying that English as a medium of instruction in technical and non-technical institutes should only be permitted if it is absolutely essential. Otherwise, let's go ahead and try to spread the use of Hindi. Even in institutions such as IIT, IIMs, AIMs, Kendriya Vidyalaya, etc., there will be an attempt to bring in as much Hindi as possible. The committee has even recommended removing English as one of the languages in examinations held for recruitment of the central services. And they are saying that at least a working knowledge of Hindi should be made compulsory. Now, as expected, the most fierce reaction from this has come from the state of Tamil Nadu and Kerala, who say that equal treatment should be given to all the languages in the 8th schedule of the constitution. The Kerala Chief Minister and the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister, both of them have written to the central government urging that these recommendations from the parliamentary panel should be ignored as much as possible. Now, I'm sure whenever you talk about the Hindi imposition debate, you all know about the three language formula. The three language formula that first came up by the Kothari Commission in 1968 said, that there should be three languages followed in the Indian education system. First language should be the mother tongue or the regional language of that region to be taught in the schools. Second language, in Hindi speaking state, it should be some other modern Indian language or English. In non-Hindi speaking states, it should be Hindi or English. Then the third language. In Hindi speaking states, English or other modern language should be the third language. And in non-Hindi speaking states, English or other modern language. In simple terms, let me give you an example. Let's say you're talking about UP. So in UP, the first language should be Hindi. The second language should be, let's assume, a South Indian language. Let's say Malayalam. And then the third language should be English. Similarly, in states such as Tamil Nadu, the first language should be Tamil. Second language can be Hindi. And third language can be English. 
This was the idea proposed by the three language formula. This was mainly for integration of the country to embrace as many languages that are prevalent in the country as possible. However, the problem was that this was never properly implemented. In North India states, for example, the states did not make an attempt to teach students about South Indian languages. And the same was seen in South Indian states. States such as Tamil Nadu, even in the Northeast, such as Tripura, were not ready to teach Hindi in their school curriculum. Similarly, in the Hindi belt in UP and Bihar, the schools were not really promoting South Indian languages. That is why the three language formula mainly remained on paper only. These were the important articles from the Hindu newspaper today. Now, a couple of practice questions. Number one. With India embracing a digitized ecosystem, cyberspace has become a serious concern of national security. Critically analyzed. Second, why has the language issue remained unresolved in India even after over seven decades of our independence? Give possible reasons. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.